Where were you the first time you saw Tony Ja in Ong Bak? Me, I was in the Navy at the time. I saw the movie on my ship, and the minute that I saw Tony Ja knock that guy out with one kick in that bar in Bangkok, I was pretty much sold. By the end of the movie, I think it was one of the most amazing martial arts films that I'd ever seen, and apparently, I wasn't the only person who felt this way. Tony Ja is, when I say one of the greatest martial artists alive today, he, he really is. He's the most talented physically ever. I think he's great. You know, being, I, I see so many action star in the world. He's uh, the one of them very, very physical. You know, action, jumping, you know, do all the things really, really good. Nobody could do what Tony Ja can do. It that means could jump over a car, walk <laughs> over you, do a flip and kick you in the head. <laughs> when I say he's the most physical, nobody can do, nobody could do that stuff. Like Not me. even Jackie Chan? I had Bruce Lee and no, Jackie Chan. Can, no, listen to what I'm saying. I'm listening. Oh, I'm listening. Jackie Chan can't do that. A few weeks ago, I actually sat down to watch Ong Bak for the first time this year. See, ever since I heard Alex over on the Kung Fu Genius show talk about how he started learning Cantonese from watching the same Kung Fu movies over and over, well, I started watching Ong Bak pretty regularly just to see if I can pick up on any Thai words. Well, this particular evening, my wife was sort of watching the movie with me, and I asked her, hey, how come Ja Panam? That's what he's called over here in Thailand. So anyway, I'm asking her, how come Ja Panam had these amazing movies? But then he went to Hollywood and he started playing in these really crappy movies like Monster Hunter. We had a pretty interesting conversation where she surprised me with some of the stuff that I never knew about Tony Ja or Ja Panam. Well, my phone must have been listening to our conversation because it seemed like the very next day I open up the YouTube app and I see this video essay from Accented Cinema on Tony Jaa's impact on the film industry. And after that, I saw a video from Viking Samurai, the rise and fall of Tony Jaa, what really happened to him. And I felt like it was more of the same stuff I've been hearing all about how Ja Panam had his meteoric ascent and then he just disappeared. But you know what? What I didn't hear from either of these videos was any of the stuff that my wife shared with me. So I figured that I'd post a video to share some of the surprising things that I learned from her about Tony Ja that pretty much everyone making these rise and fall of Tony Ja videos and articles got wrong. So as I was saying, when Ja Panam arrived on the scene in Ong Bak, it was like the game completely changed. Donnie Yen admitted that after seeing Ong Bak, it made him step up his game, and we started to see the immediate shift from Hong Kong style of action that was based on the Chinese opera to his movies having this more grittier type of fighting that's seen in Sha Polong, uh, Dragon Tiger Gate, and especially in Flashpoint, where his fighting style was like a mixture of Kung Fu and MMA. Well, Ja Panam took what he did in Ong Bak, and he dialed it up to a completely new level in Tom Young Goon. There was this Muay Thai versus Capoeira fight with Latif Crowder Dos Santos in the Thai Buddhist temple. There was that four minute long fight in the hotel restaurant that was one continuous take when Ja Panam is going to the restaurant on the top level to confront Johnny. Now, as if that wasn't amazing enough, he tops the restaurant scene by fighting something like a hundred henchmen in the final act of the film. This movie was like Ja Panam was acting out a video game where you have to plow through hundreds of minions before the big boss fight at the end. But after that, things started to fizzle. Ja Panam made his directorial debut in Ong Bak 2, which was supposed to be a prequel to Ong Bak, and the entire movie felt like it was a sprint all the way to the end. It was action non-stop, and I remember the conversations around the movie back then. We couldn't believe that Ja Panam was doing Kung Fu, Kendo, grappling, and Muay Thai. Like, your boy showed out in this movie. But then there was all the behind the scenes drama and all that stuff got over embellished by the time it got across the ocean to the fans in the U.S. All I heard was how Ja Panam disappeared for two months in the middle of the movie. He went crazy and became a monk. They might not even finish the movie. 
And then when he did return, the Ong Bak prequel became two movies, Ong Bak 2 and Ong Bak 3. I remember the reviews saying how Ja Panam looked lifeless in Ong Bak 3. And then there was the somewhat abrupt ending to Ong Bak 3, like they were just ready to get the movie over and complete it. Well, after all of that, Ja Panam really did take a break and he spent some time at a temple. And when he came back, well, he did the sequel to Tom Young Goon before making the jump to Hollywood, where he appeared in the Fast and Furious Part 7. And then he did the skin trade with Dolph Lundgren and Michael Jai White. He did a Chinese film, Sha Po Long 2, with Jackie Wu Jing. He would link back up with Vin Diesel for Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage, where we also got to see Ja Panam link up with Donnie Yen. And the thing is that... In 2005, after Tom Young Goon, we were looking at Ja Panam as the next big thing. He had that Bruce Lee swag where you just knew he was the baddest dude in the room. And he did all these crazy stunts like Jackie Chan. Everyone was looking at Ja Panam as the dude who would pick up the torch that was left by Bruce Lee. And he was going to take it to a completely new level. Well, 20 years after the debut of Ong Bak, the conversation with many martial arts movie fans in the West is that He's this case study on what happens when you peak too soon and then flame out. So it seems like the question that everybody's asking is, well, why is that? What happened to cause Ja Panam to go from the guy who was supposed to be the next Bruce Lee to a supporting character who seems like he's just in these movies to look cool? Well, if you follow the gossip around Ja Panam, you'll hear what I've since learned are just a bunch of really dumb rumors coming from people who really don't know what they're talking about. Maybe you've heard some of these. Tony Ja quit making movies to become a monk and he was never the same after he came back. Oh, Tony Ja's problem was he spent too much time promoting Ang Bak instead of making better movies. Oh, it was a language barrier. Tony Jaw couldn't speak English, and that's why he couldn't make the jump to Hollywood. Oh, it was the passing of his mentor. Once Pana Ritter died, Tony Jaw just wasn't the same. So the whole monk thing, that's BS. In Thai culture, it's a common practice for men to take some time off and become a monk for a very short period of time. It's not as big of a deal as people in the West make it out to be. For example, a person might have a parent or a close relative pass away, and as part of the mourning process, they might spend a week at the village temple as a monk. The English thing, there is some truth to that one, but it's no longer true anymore. Around 2014, Ja Panam started working intensively to improve his English speaking ability. And there are interviews on YouTube with Ja Panam that are almost 10 years old, where he has no problem conducting the entire interview in English. As for the passing of his mentor, Panaritakre, no one has any idea how much or how little that impacted Ja Panam unless they've spoken with him personally. So don't believe the rumors. See, here's what no one is saying when they talk about the so-called fall of Tony Ja. They never talk about the role of Sahamon Khan Films. Ja Panam signed with Sahamon Khan Film to an exclusive contract. They control pretty much everything he did. All of those appearances Ja Panam did to promote Ong Bak just before the debut of Tom Young Goon or The Protector, that was all set up by Sahamon Khan. So he couldn't be out working on new movies instead of promoting Ong Bak. That was up to the studio. Now, why am I bringing the studio into this? It's like I said, the studio, they controlled everything. They control what movies Ja Panam was working on, his paycheck. They even took on the responsibility of taking care of Ja Panam's family. And this is a massive thing in Thai culture. If you're a young person out working and your parents say that you aren't sending money home to take care of the family, you can go to jail over here. Famous people might get away with whatever that filial piety charges that they hit you with, but the public will quickly turn on them. According to Ja Panam, everything he did was controlled or managed by Saha Khan Film. And when he eventually broke away from them around 2013 and signed with his own management agent, Saha Khan tried to block him from playing in Fast and the Furious 7, and they were demanding a payment of $50 million at one point. 
Now, I'm not going to speculate on what happened with Ja Panam and Saha Khan film, but after The Protector 2 in 2014 or Tom Young Goon Part 2, Tony Ja really hasn't been in a Thai production. His appearances in Skin Trade, Never Back Down, No Surrender, and Triple Threat, those were Western productions. Paradox, which is supposed to be the third movie in the Sha Palong series, was mostly shot right down the street from me around walking street here in Pattaya, but it's a Chinese movie. And I bring this up because when we talk about Ja Panam's career and what happened, the fact that he's not making any movies in Thailand is a huge part of the discussion that no one is talking about. And see, this is important because when we talk about how Ja Panam was going to be the next Bruce Lee, we also have to look at how they moved as business people. Ja Panam talked about this in one of his interviews. He said people ask him why he doesn't show out in some movies or why he loses fights and it comes down to control. He's an actor who is acting in a story. Whether he's fighting or doing whatever it is required of his character, he's doing what the directors and the stunt coordinators are telling him to do. Bruce Lee reached a point where he basically had full control of what was going to happen when he was in Hong Kong, but he did not have that level of control in Enter the Dragon. Even though most people think he did, he didn't. And maybe it's good he didn't because we never would have had that mirror room scene had it been up to Bruce. I mentioned Ja Panam not making any movies in Thailand that were Thai productions after Protector 2 because it's in Thailand where Ja Panam would have the most control over the story, the fights, pretty much everything. Well, maybe not directing after Ong Bak 2, you know, because it had so many problems and those last two movies were box office disasters. But I think that he would have learned his lesson by now. But see, something about Bruce Lee's movies were that they were really an audition for him to land a big Hollywood role. If Bruce lived, his plan was to do one movie in Hollywood and one movie in Hong Kong, whether that be with Golden Harvest or the Shaw Brothers. In Hong Kong, Bruce pretty much could do whatever he wanted, but in Hollywood, Bruce was going to have to play the game with the Hollywood executives. And I think that this is the biggest lesson that Ja Panam could have learned from Bruce Lee's example if he were to truly become the next Bruce Lee. The other thing is Ja Panam, he has to accept who he is as an actor. See, Bruce Lee, he really was an actor. And I mean, like, yo, he really, really was an actor. Bruce started acting in movies when he was like five or six years old. When he came to America, his focus was on martial arts and opening like this Kung Fu school empire where he invent this super Kung Fu style. But at some point he realized that it would be easier to spread his ideas about martial arts as an actor. So he stepped back into that role. Ja Panam was a stunt man. He started learning like this tricking version of Muay Thai and his mentor Panaritakray basically put him on in a project to showcase his protege and this Muay Thai style they created. Now think about something that Bruce Lee said in an interview. He said for him as an actor, it's important to know why he's fighting. And I hate to say this, but sometimes a Ja Panam fight is just showcasing his abilities, which are amazing. But again, do they serve a purpose for the story? Another thing, think about how much or really how little Jaws characters speak in his movies. And Ong Bak, the most memorable thing that he says is his name is Ting and that he's from Nong Pradu. And Tom Young Goon, he runs around yelling, Chang Yunai, Chang Yunai, through three quarters of the movie. And that means, where's my elephant? It's really kind of a joke because Ja Panam actually has a cameo in The Bodyguard 2 where he starts yelling Chang Yunai and he beats up these guys using all the same moves from the protector fight scenes. And then it turns out that, well, he's looking for a stuffed animal of an elephant. It's Chang Tukata. <laughs> but anyway, since I mentioned that joke, this is probably the most important thing that no one ever says when they talk about Ja Panam and it's this. We look at Ja Panam's character as this serious dude. He's always looking for something. And he does these fights where he flips over people and kicks them in the back of the head. He's doing flying knees and elbows. I mean, he's amazing. But we're not paying attention at all to the real story. And what I mean is this. Ja Panam's two biggest roles, Tom Young Goong and Ong Bak, his character is really the straight man in a comedy. Think about it. I mean, in both of those movies, isn't there that one really silly guy who is kind of inept and doesn't it seem like he has the most speaking lines in both movies? I mean, hey, I heard from one of my teachers to pay attention who has the most lines in a movie because then you can tell who is really the most important character. 
See, the most important character isn't actually Kam or Ting, even though he's the guy doing all the fighting. Those are Ja Panam's characters. It's actually the character played by Mom Jokmok because his characters actually progress in the story. So Mom Jokmok was a big stand up comedian in Bangkok. And I say was because, well, now he's a huge movie star. If you watch Thai movies, you will start to feel like this guy is in everything. And do you know how big he was even when he did Ong Bak, which was very early into his movie career? The girl who's the third protagonist in that movie, Moilek, that's the character's name. That's Mom Jokmok's niece. Over here, Mom Jokmok is huge. And I think if Japanam and Mom Jokmok were to put out a Thai movie today, more people would probably turn out to see the movie from Mom Jokmok than Japanam. Like people love that guy over here. And I'm telling y'all, if you don't watch Thai movies, this guy, it feels like he's in everything. He plays detectives, crazy people, monks, lady boys. Look, it doesn't matter. See, if you're going to talk about any mistakes made by Ja Panam, it's not this stuff that people are saying when they talk about the fall of Tony Ja. If I'm Ja Panam, look, man, I go to Hollywood, I go to China, I even go to Bollywood to take some part that will get me paid. And then I come back to Thailand to make a movie where I get to be the hero or I get to be the person behind the scenes who gets to call all of the shots. Also do the thing that Bruce Lee was attempting to do. In Bruce's case, it was to take his guys from Hong Kong to Hollywood, but to also bring Hollywood to Hong Kong in order to completely change the filmmaking industry in Hong Kong. And that's what I personally wish Ja Panam had done or finds a way to do because, I mean, he's still working. He's only 47. And you know what? He's in Expendables 4. Like I said, he's still out there getting work. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff that people are getting wrong about Tony Jaw when they talk about the rise and fall of his career because the man's still working. He's still making movies. But I got a question for y'all. Why is it that anyone can talk about the fall of Tony Jaw as if he's some kind of a failure? I follow Ja Panam on social media and it looks to me like he's picking and choosing his projects. Some of them like Chinatown Detective 3, he gets to have fun and show his silly side. Other films like Paradox, he gets to do his thing for the short time his character's in the movie, and then he collects a check and he goes back to living life, and there's no huge time commitment involved. Yeah, he has a movie like Monster Hunter where it's just, well, yeah. <laughs> but look, Ja Panam has a family, he owns land, and he's got a big house here in Thailand. He's probably earned enough money to where he doesn't really need to work anymore. So, I mean, like, how can we talk about him as if he's a failure? Is it because he didn't reach some goal that other people set for him to become the next Bruce Lee? I mean, I'm not sure that that's a goal anyone really wants. When you stop to consider that Bruce Lee drove himself so hard that he ended up with a pretty serious cocaine addiction. He had a whole host of health issues we're still learning about to this day 50 years later. And then he died at the early age of 32. Bruce didn't get a chance to enjoy what he worked so hard to achieve. He didn't get a chance to see his kids grow up into adults. I think Ja Panam's time at that temple in 2013 made him think about how much work he put in to get where he was. You know, one of his early jobs was a stuntman on the Thai TV show Red Eagle. Think of Red Eagle as like the Thai version of Nightwing, but there's no Batman. Anyway, they were filming a scene for Red Eagle right here in Jam Tien Beach where I live and a guy fell off a helicopter and he died. Thais are really superstitious about stuff like that and people kind of give you a look when you mention that Red Eagle show. Tony Ja worked on that and who knows, maybe he'd been working on that stunt with that helicopter on that day. My point is, life is short. This dude was part of something great that put him in a place where maybe he decides, you know... I can keep doing these small roles in Hollywood productions where it's much safer than the stuff that I was doing when I was in my 20s. And if I work one or two projects a year, I can enjoy my life with my wife and my kids. I'd call that a success, but you know, that's not controversial. No one wants to hear that story. And that's just an example of things about Tony Ja that we all got wrong. We got it wrong that he failed because as Bruce Lee said, I'm not in this world to live up to your expectations and you're not in this world to live up to mine. But hey, 
If you want to hear more about how Bruce Lee was going to completely shake up the movie industry in Hong Kong, be sure to check out this video. Or if you want to hear more about upcoming Kung Fu movies, be sure to check out this other video on Yip Man 5. Hope you guys enjoyed this break from talking about fake Bruce Lee stories from some of these so-called Bruce Lee experts on YouTube. I got a lot of other Bruce Lee myths to bust and I want to get back to some of my other topics that I've been holding off covering for a few months. So, hey, I got a long list of video topics to cover. And while I decide what I'll tackle next on my list, I hope you guys keep training. Remember to breathe and come back to see me on the next video.